by here, it's actually a whole different market. There's no uh, residential homes. Uh, there's no HOAs. You know, it's a fully commercial, commercialized district. There's a lot of retail. There's these older big box stores. I don't think I want to build there. I want to be closer to a certain area of that quadrant. So what I did is I then mapped out to even become more efficient the quadrant into the hours is what I call. So 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, right? And in this case, you have one more hour. But uh, you get the idea. You can, you, you can usually do it by the hour. So if you look at your watch and you map your city, it should look like a clock, OK? Now, like I said earlier, these two portions, really good. These two portions, not so much. Eliminate. We don't have time. We cannot get distracted because we will not get to the end goal. There is plenty of opportunity in even half of this if you look hard enough. Plenty. So now we've identified this is the fastest growing area in Tucson or in Phoenix or in Houston or in Dallas or in Fort Worth or wherever you are in the country. This is the fastest growing quadrant. Excellent. Now let's try to hone it in a little bit. Find the fastest growing hour within that fastest, or two hours within that fastest growing quadrant. And you know what that'll be in Miami. You know what that'll be in Dallas. You, you should know what that'll be you know, in other parts of the country. Now, once you've identified this area, what if I told you that you cannot lose money, no matter what you did? So even if you missed my criteria by a little bit, you cannot lose money anymore. You have now put yourself in a position where every dollar that you put, you will get back and never, ever lose money. Just because you, you gridded and you quadranted the system, right? So now we're good. We have a good benchmark. We're confident that if we go in, the chance of losing money is next to zero because you are in the highest growth hour within your city or two hours, right? So you've narrowed it down to that much. Now, as a result of that, I ended up over here. This is actually one of my developments, right? So I realized at the time that this is a massive opportunity. There's lots of growth, subdivisions galore. Home prices were starting in the 200s, which is perfect, right? At that time, this is 10 years ago. So I would, I would equate that to about 350 or 400 right now in today's world. Um, so home prices start at 200,000. You know, you have all these fresh uh, families coming in. These fresh families have needs. They need to work out. They need to wash their cars. They need to fix their HVAC. They need to mow their lawns. They need to do all of these things. Guess what? I'm going to be the guy that does that all for them. I'm going to be that one business that gives them all of these services, right? And so as a result, I ended up buying this deal. Um, and it was right here once again. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. This is what the deal uh, looks like on Google. Let me see if this works. To the external site. OK. So this is my first, very first Flexspace development. And I've shown this to you guys many times, maybe. I don't know if you guys have seen it or not. But this is my very first Flexspace development. Now, how does a guy come from a different country, not know the culture, <coughs> not know anything, not know how to open a bank account, not know how to get a driver's license, come in and build a flex space, all right? And this happened because I gridded. So one day, I was gridding, and there was a site, and I'm going to go on it right now if I can. Um, and so there was this site that I drove, and I met this gentleman who I thought was a contractor. And so I'm driving, I'm gridding, I'm doing my thing, I'm talking to all these vendors, you know, they're all uh, uh, either, you know, uh, different languages or there's something I can't communicate, there's a lot of hand communication going on between me and them. And we're trying to figure out, you know, like, what do you do? Can you come and help me if I do this, right? And so one day, I, I meet this guy named Alex Bibb, and I talk about him a lot. Um, and I will continue. I hope I can get him to the conference. It would be really nice if I did. So this site is one street over from the site that I built, which was right here. 
okay, this side. So one day I meet this guy and he's uh, clearing dirt. And cle by clearing dirt, you see this dirt over here, it's cleared. So just like that. So he has this little bobcat um, and he's masked up so I can only see, he's wearing sunglasses so I can't even see skin. And he's driving this machine and he's clearing dirt. I was like, oh cool, this guy looks like, you know, he's a one man show, he's clearing dirt. If I ever buy anything, I can use him to clear dirt. Park my car, go down, I wave, 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 he sees me, he comes to me, he gets down, removes his headpiece, removes his sunglasses, um, and he's like, hey man, how can I help you? And I'm like, hold on, wait a minute, you're not, you're not like, you know, what do you mean, hey man, how can I help you? And he's like, yeah, I own, I own the dirt. And I was like, Okay, he's like, yeah, I'm the owner, but I also have expertise, because I grew up on a farm, I have expertise on how to clear it and how to like, get it ready for pad and all that. So I'm gonna do as much work as I can so I can save money. And at that time, I was 29, this guy was 25. So 25-year-old guy, owns his land, he's coming in, you know, moving machinery, I was fascinated. I was like, hey, what are you gonna build? And so he had this uh, drawing that I, I, I wish I can show you guys. Um, he had this drawing on his uh, on the front of his on, on the front of his project. Let's see, no, it's not there anymore. So he had this drawing on the front of his project, which was a facade. It had a garage door and an office bay, and it was just a facade. It looked like that, and and I think the connection I had with this project was because of my work from back home. I understood flex spaces. I knew that this was something that is needed. I operated out of it. I worked on cars in it. I did my dyno business off of it. I had friends who operated in their flex space, upholstery business, all the car related traits, right? Tires, suspensions, upholstery. Everybody was in a flex space. So all my connections all needed this product. And so when I saw it, I think subliminally I was like, okay, I need to stop here and I need to talk to this guy and see what he's doing. So ended up meeting Alex. Alex was an offshore oil rig broker. So he brokered uh, offshore oil rigs. And uh, I think they're the, the rigs that are like end of life type rigs where you know, uh, larger companies can't deal with them anymore because they don't make money so smaller companies come in and buy them and try to you know, squeeze every dollar they can. And so Alex traveled a lot. He traveled to Abu Dhabi, he traveled to Dubai, um, and he traveled to all parts of the world and he was a busy guy. And so I was like, okay, I have a proposal. I will work for you, I don't need to get paid, um, and I will watch your site as, because I was gridding anyways. I was driving the neighborhoods, I was in the area. I probably drove his site like 10 times a day, you know, in, in process of me learning. And so I was like, I'll man your site for you, um, and I don't want anything in exchange. And even better, I have connections in Dubai. So when you go there next time, give me a call. And so he was like, yeah, great, amazing, good guy. He ends up getting deliveries, calls me. He's like, hey man, I'm out of the country, could you, uh, could you pick up my, you know. So what I'm doing in the back end is I'm making a note of everything. Okay, this costs this much, I took delivery of it, this is the quantity, this is the type, this is the, the metal building supplier, you know, um, this is the, the company that offloaded it, this is where he bought this from. And I'm basically, what I was doing in my mind is, um, at that time, I knew I wanted to do something, but I think this is what solidified it for me, because I actually saw what he built it for. And there was nothing else in the market that you could build for that much, nothing. Right, so low building, fairly simple as you guys can see. Um, there were some inefficiencies in this product that I made more efficient on my end, and I'll walk you guys through those. Alex's building, if you guys will notice, is this, right? Flex space zero is what I call it. So flex space zero, beautiful product. You have a garage door, storefront, awning, stone, stucco. Now what you don't have is you don't have the elevation. So all in all, this was, this is a 10 by 10, I believe, door. So his, his height was very short. It was short off by a couple of feet. It was just short off what I would call a grand flex space, right? And so it was a nice product. I, I saw him lease it. He leased it like that, put up a sign, no Facebook strategy, no nothing, drive by traffic, he got it leased up. At the time, Alex only built this one building. Just one. So he had this piece of land, he builds one building, and it's done, it's over. And I was like, hey, what's going on, man? Um, you know, you have this whole land, what are you gonna do? He's like, oh, I'm gonna build all of this based off of the first building. 
And I was like, could you explain? Like, what do you mean build? Like, I, I didn't understand leverage. I didn't know what all that was. Dubai was a cash market. I didn't know that you could refi and like do all these creative things, right? And so he's like, yeah. So I'm like, could you explain that to me? Like, what does that mean? He's like, well, now that I've added value, the property is actually worth more. This allows me now to go and build the second building from the cash flow I get from the first building. And I was like, okay. Now, the caveat is that he needed to pre-lease the second building. He couldn't build it. The bank wouldn't give him the money until he pre-leased the second building. So Alex went on a hunt. And the hunt that he went on was he wanted to find one tenant for the entire building so he could build it. He didn't want to deal with five tenants. So unlike his first building, which was four tenants, he was like, look, I don't care. I just want to build it and get it over with. So I'm going to find one tenant. So he found this one tenant. It was an oil and gas company, Texaco. And uh, they signed the lease with him. And he built the product. And I was like, hold on, wait a minute. What did they ask you? What did the bank exactly ask you for when you built the second building? Because at this point, what I'm doing is I'm trying to minimize my risk. What if I don't find a tenant? How do I continue building if I don't have a tenant? And so Alex is like, well, they asked me for an LOI and a lease, a signed contract with this company. And I'm like, OK, anything else? Like, I don't want to get screwed out of like, you know, oh, we need these seven, eight documents more for us to continue development. He's like, no, that's it. They asked for a copy of the contract. Well, they asked for the LOI, the letter of intent, and then they asked for a copy of the contract. And I was like, that's it. And he's like, yeah, that's it. And so, I, you know, just laughingly, I asked him, so what if your friend signed the, the, the LOI and the contract? He's like, yeah, I guess that would work. I'm like, okay, all right, funny, but, you know, maybe it's something that could, that could work for me if, had, you know, if I'm in this tough situation. So at this point, Alex builds the second building then carries on to build three more buildings on this side, right? All phased out. One building at a time, takes his sweet time. Um, this is the point where I lose touch with Alex. So he's still my friend. He just gets so busy in the oil, oil and gas world. I think oil had declined significantly. There was plenty of opportunities. So he was all over the world trying to you know, fix whatever it was that he needed to fix. Now, the interesting part here is, is that I didn't create any of this. Alex did. Phase out development, flex space ideas, uh, design, structure, elevations. I did nothing. Alex did it all. And I just took it, and I made it my own, and I made it a little more efficient. And with efficiency comes money. Okay. OK, here you go. We're back. And so I took Alex's existing model, and I made it more efficient. And let me show you some of the efficiencies to give you guys a better understanding of how simple and easy it was to reduce. I'm good. I'm good. I fixed it. Yeah. So this is my building. First thing you'll notice is there's no stucco. Zero stucco. Did I lose any value? No, I didn't lose any value. The tenants are still willing to pay me the same amount of money that they were willing to pay Alex. How do I know? Because I have the benchmarks, right? So I was like, OK, cool. I can lose stucco. Roofs, unfinished. Non-painted, unfinished roofs, bare. So the metal on all my roofs is unfinished. No color, no color scheme, no nothing. Stone, only goes up to three feet. Minimal design, nothing fancy, nothing complicated. Wait, what, what, what? Stone. stone? Okay. Here, you see that stone over there? Ah, okay. yes. See that stone right there? Okay. Three feet. That's it. Um, awnings. You see the awning? Unfinished. Yes. Ed? Yeah. So my question is this. In the residential world, Mm -hmm. often. And I've started to see these uh, three panel uh, and these um, same type in, in, uh, in, in the industrial spaces. Is that something that we're going through? If it could continue to reduce our build out costs, uh, decrease the time of, of, of the build, but yet provide the same uh, product at the same rates? Is that something that you predict? So there is no faster way to build than prefab. 
this is all prefab. This is the fastest way to build. You can erect a building in a day. So the bulk of the work is your earthwork, and that depends on weather, right? So, okay, so we lost all those things, right? right? No windows, so Alex's product had a window here, I don't know if you guys remember it, with stucco in the front, no stucco. There's a banner there that says KD Boxing Gym right here, become a member, right? Now, I eliminated all these things, but I did one thing different. I added somewhere where I really thought it made a big difference, a huge difference, and that's something that I'll share with you guys just now. The elevation, right? The one thing that your tenants will find most important is the elevation, right there. So instead of doing Alex's move, which was 10 feet doors, in fact, I don't know if you remember Alex's doors, they were garage doors, proper garage doors. Those things are expensive. This is very basic steel and chain door. It is the cheapest door you can find in the market. There's nothing that beats it, and it's bare. It comes white, and then you paint it whatever color you want, right? The one thing that I did change is the elevation. So instead of going 12 feet, I went 15 feet. So I added three feet um, onto the building, and that elevation, believe it or not, changed the game for me. Because as I started leasing these spaces, I actually surpassed Alex's rents. And I would call Alex, and Alex would call me and be like, hey man, um, I have a tenant, I'm sending him your way because I'm full. So I'm just gonna send him your way because you know, there's nothing for me to do with him. And so I was like, okay. So as these tenants came in, I realized I could jack up the price because they would compare. They'd be like, oh, the one we were looking at is like 12 feet, this actually, worked. and they would be talking with each other. And so now I am thinking, okay, how can I you know, exploit this situation to where, or how can I start doing my research on what I can, where is the cap, right? And so I think at that time when we started, we were at like 95 cents a square foot, and this is a long time ago. Um, I took my product up to $1.14 or $1.15 a square foot gross, okay? And, and then me and Alex would have conversations every now and then. We'd be like, hey man, how's your, doing, how's your flex space doing? He's like, oh, I signed a five-year lease. You know, I'm good. I don't need to worry about it. And then he would ask me, and every year I would go up on the rent. And initially he was like, are you sure you want to sign a one-year lease with these guys? Are you sure about it? I'm like, yeah, why not? One year is great. And then every year, just go up, just go up, just go up. By the time I was done with my development, which is this one, uh, I think we were at the $1.30 gross um, to a dollar forty gross uh, in rents. And so the upside for me was just crazy. At that time to build something like this, my all-in construction cost with build out, $55 a square foot. 55 bucks a square foot, that's crazy. 55 bucks a square foot, you know? It's just like unbelievable. Um, but that's kind of what that first development looked like for me. All right. That's my project. We'll go into it in a little more detail a little later on. Now we're gonna talk about analyzing your markets. Now, I, I've already told you guys that the data doesn't exist, so you're gonna have to find out everything for yourselves. I can't help you. You're the only person that can. How are you gonna help yourself? We have uh, a strategy, which is our Facebook strategy. We recommend that everybody run it two times in the life cycle of their flex spaces, right? Your tenants, these 1,500 to 5,000 square foot tenants do not exist on LinkedIn. So do not waste your time <clears throat> posting about the successes of your land, uh, posting about the successes of your you know, flex space journey on LinkedIn because it really doesn't matter unless you're a fund or a syndicator uh, and you're trying to show the success of the fund or the syndication. That's a separate story. But you're, nobody really exists on LinkedIn. Um, everybody's on Facebook. Everybody's on Facebook, Facebook Marketplace, they're selling used boats, used this, lawnmower repair. Everybody lives on Facebook. Your tenants and their customers live on Facebook. The customers live on Facebook because the businesses are on Facebook. The businesses are on the Facebook because the customers are on Facebook. They're not going anywhere. I don't see this changing anytime soon. So when do we first use our Facebook marketing strategy and what is that ad strategy, right? Um, the Facebook marketing strategy is for example, we had a member uh, who was based out of Dallas, who is still currently based out of Dallas, uh, looking for multiple areas within Dallas. He was looking between three cities, and he, he had a hard decision to make. He had, he had enough money to invest in either city, 
how do we then find out which city is best for us? And this is how we do it. We run a strategy where we create a, what we call a ghost ad for a ghost property that really doesn't exist. And the way it works is, um, it's a very basic ad. We run it on, through our Facebook account. First thing you do is you create a Facebook page for said business park, right? Whatever, name it whatever. Hamza Business Park 1, Hamza Business Park 2, Hamza Business Park 3. They're in three different locations. You create the Facebook pages, and now you run the strategy. Warehouse for rent, 1,500 square feet. Uh, all of this is available in the, re in the resources tab on your, uh, uh, in the database, okay? Um, flex space for rent, even with the words and the images that you can use. They're all there in the resources section. So you run this ad, you spend $10 a day for 10 days. So you spend $100 on each location. You get a ton of data live that you can see now, that you can interact with, right? You get cost per click. Cost per click tells you how much demand there is for the product. You get forms that are filled out, which give you what type of businesses are looking for this product, right? Um, and then you get people messaging you, hey, I need to talk to someone right now. I, I filled out the form, and, I, so, and then, so you get a sense of urgency. For a product that you haven't built yet, yes. Does the form have questions that you dictate? Yes, and the form is on the, in the resources tab, okay? We are eliminating all the mistakes. So imagine, I told you that if you just stick to a certain hour in your city, there's 0% of you, 0% chance of you losing money, right? Now, even before you invest in that hour, now you can run ads and see what the demand is like to double check the fact that you are growing in that area, right? So let's say you run the ad. So of course, Facebook does have a restriction when you run ads. It's 15 miles from the location. You cannot shrink it down. Uh, and that is per real estate guidelines and laws, right? So you have to go up 15 miles. Um, but it gives you a pretty good idea as to which city is good. So if I ran the ad, for example, in three different demographics, in three different areas, uh, I would get three different results. But what I would be able to dictate from those results is which area is the most popping, which area is the one that's giving me the most interest, who is looking where, when, um, and what are the businesses? Because that's actually one of the questions. What is your business? You know, are you a welder? Are you this? Are you that? And they, can, they have to pick it in order to move forward to the next question. Okay, now when it comes to the ad, I'm gonna give you a little bit of like psychology. You don't want it to be too long, uh, the questionnaire, and you don't want it to be too short. Because if it's too short, you're gonna get an influx of people who are filling out the form that are not real like tenants. If it's too long, people lose interest after a certain number of questions based on all the information that we have. So we've set in our resources section, seven questions, very easy. Some of them are drop down, first name, last name, email, phone number, that's four. And then three are related to the business. How many square feet are you looking for? 1,500, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. What is your business? This is what I do. Um, do you have a website? Yes, no, if you do, what's the website? That's it, end of story. You don't, we don't need more information than that because we are just collecting information at this point. We're collecting data. We're not really interested in leasing because we have nothing to lease, right? A bunch of our members found success in places that they never thought they would find success in because of this Facebook strategy. So, we are, as we move along, we are fact-checking ourselves continuously and constantly. Now, the way I like to run my ads, and I'm going to show you guys what I spend so you guys have an idea, is local reach, $800, $20 per day, okay? 44,000, 1,300 clicks, $50 a day. $20 a day, 13,233 clicks. This ad right here, was my best performing ad. And I think it was, I spent 700, whatever. I think it was because I took a picture with an iPhone. Um, it wasn't a choreographed picture. It didn't have too much uh, professionalism in it. It was just a basic picture that I edited on my iPhone and it looked real. And, I'm, and I think what it is is when people saw it, they could relate to it. They're like, oh, this looks real, like the real product. Uh, maybe some mild edits. But it wasn't like, it wasn't Kelvin who was taking the pictures, let's just say that. It was me, 